So, so just in case you're wondering, that is the Heavy Chef song. Um, the lyrics are pretty much Heavy Chef, Heavy Chef, Heavy Chef, and then Licky, 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 Boom, Boom. So you can sing along the next time you get it on Spotify, which I actually believe it is on Spotify at the moment. So my name is Fred Road. I'm the founder, uh, co-founder of Heavy Chef and, um, and the CEO of, uh, of Heavy Chef. And, uh, and I'm very happy to be here in Johannesburg tonight. I want to just quickly give a little bit of an introduction to what Heavy Chef is so that you understand that this has nothing to do with cooking. Uh, this is not a cooking show and I'm not Gordon Ramsay, <laughs> uh, although I do bear apparently a striking resemblance to the man, the great man. I do not have the ability to swear as prolifically as he does. Um, but just so that you know, Heavy Chef is a platform for entrepreneurs. We believe that entrepreneurs, uh, of whom there are many in this room, uh, have the ability to change the world for the better. We do that in the form of a platform that offers bite-sized learning. So little videos uh, of these nuggets of knowledge from s technologists, leaders, creatives, people who have been in the trenches, who've eaten their own food, so to speak. So we believe in peer-to-peer -peer learning. So essentially, we try and glean learning about all the various salient topics that are important to entrepreneurs. And we put them on, on heavychef.com. So if anyone who is not a member of Heavy Chef, please go and sign up. Either sign up to the actual platform or subscribe to our newsletter at heavychef.com. And, uh, and you'll receive updates on all the good stuff that we're doing. We basically re we, we release uh, at the moment, it's about 30 new learning videos per week. Uh, so we, we have a huge repository of, uh, of, of learning bites that are available to, to all the people who are subscribed to Heavy Chef. And, um, and I do happen to see uh, a number of our Heavy Chefs in the audience tonight. So welcome to those of you who have featured uh, on the platform and thank you for your contributions. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a journey and it's been an amazing ride for us since February last year. Uh, Louis, I stand to be corrected. Louis is uh, my co-founder over there and the CEO of the Heavy Chef Foundation. I think we've put out over 2,000 learning bites since February last year. So it's a, it's a lot of learning and, uh, and we're very excited about the, pr the progress and, uh, and the community that has grown. But I, I want to quickly just, um, just honor the people that have supported us uh, over the past couple of years and particularly... Um, our, our partners, Payfast and Zero, who've been with us right from the beginning, who've really supported us and who align with our values and who believe that, uh, that, that the entrepreneurs are possibly the most important people within our economy at the moment and who can resolve many of the challenges that we're facing. Ex Nilo, uh, Workshop 17, Capitalize, Whipping the Cat, which is a legal services firm with a freaking cool name. Uh, Baxberg, the sumptuous Cape wine that you're sipping away on outside there. So Fruit, uh, who didn't arrive <laughs> this evening, but we thank them anyway because they've been pretty <laughs> consistent with their delivery to date. We love you, so Fruit. Um, and Goodleaf, uh, the CBD water that I see some of you already have that won't get you high, I promise. Um, uh, Creed Living and Global Citizen. I know there's a couple of people from Global Citizen here tonight, so Ola, welcome. Um, our tech team, Black Maverick, at the back there, just doing some amazing work. Paul, thank you, sir. I appreciate you. And Massimo, making sure that all the, the tech works fine. And, uh, and Justin Sandman, our videographer, award-winning videographer, who now has, uh, we have to put that little uh, prefix to his name. And, uh, and, and especially from my side, the Heavy Chef team. So, Zsuzsa, Randall, Bronwyn, Zola, Mo, Siobonga, Lucano, Yolandi, Charmaine, and Louis. Um, I see you guys. And, uh, and very uh, particularly, uh, Queen Z, Queen Zinclair over here, who um, uh, she is a director of the Heavy Chef Foundation, but is also an admitted attorney and a tax and fiduciary specialist at Investec. 
So uh, she knows her stuff, and uh, I'm very, very happy to hand over the reins to her tonight. And I, I just wanted to also mention that we're going to be opening up to questions tonight. Obviously, we've got two luminaries on our stage here, and uh, we are going to be uh, throwing all the questions at them. I want to encourage some crowd participation here tonight from you guys, just to get in amongst it, ask the questions that you've been burning to ask. Branding is such a vast topic. It's something that we've been asking so many people who come onto the Heavy Shift platform about, and we get a different answer every single time. If you ask somebody, what is a brand? It's never a consistent answer because there's such a subjective point of view behind it. And it also happens to be one of the hardest things in business to do is to create a valued brand. It's almost, it's, you know, it's almost an insurmountable hill to create a brand that just has the heart and minds of you know, the people that you want to serve. And so we want to really lift the lid, get under the bonnet of this topic and, uh, and try and get some answers and have some healthy discussion around it. So encourage anybody who does have a question just to put up their hand. Um, keep it to a question. That's cool, because I know that everybody wants to share their opinion. So um, we will have some networking afterwards, and uh, and you can talk to the hills after that. But uh, but this session, when we pass out the mic, is is primarily intended for questions for our speakers. Zinclair will be uh, cutting you off <laughs> if you do uh, take the stage and do a diatribe, some long-winded soliloquy where you talk about your experiences that's awesome but keep it for the wine bar afterwards just a quick note to say uh, welcome to the faithful to nature women entrepreneurs who are supported by zero in workshop 17 and a note that we have a few more days i think there's only three more days to vote for uh, south africa's uh, most exciting uh, startups awards which is happening on december the first it's our premier event our premier event and, uh, and there's, it's just such a beautiful celebration, shining a light on the hard work that's been done over the past 12 months, which has been a fairly brutal year for many. And I think uh, here we have some, uh, some former winners uh, here tonight. And, and uh, it's, it's just a great way just to kind of underpin the, the stories of the amazing work that's been done. So lastly, there will be a prize at the end of the night for the best question. So um, articulate your, uh, your sentence as well. Think about the, the, the queries that you have for our speakers. Uh, we have a, um, a team of Investec tax and fiduciary specialists standing outside here tonight. Jokes, that's not true. We, it's kind of me and Mo and a couple of people in the Heavy Chef team that will be WhatsApping each other saying, that's a good question. So we will... Uh, we'll hand out that bag, that, that auspicious looking black bag, which has in it a, uh, a, a signed copy of Brandalism, uh, the book written uh, by Mike Sharman, and, uh, and a, a Heavy Chef marketing book, as well as a, um, a container of uh, Sally Ann Creed, Creed Living Collagen, which apparently is really good for you. I'm, I, don't, I think it's you know, it's good for your skin, your teeth, and your bones. All I know is that it's worth 800 bucks. So it's in there, and it's waiting for you if you are interested in such things. And, um, and I just wanted to say, lastly, thank you to you guys uh, for coming out, giving up your time, supporting Heavy Chef, supporting each other, supporting the entrepreneur sector, which is such an important part of, of our world and, and the way forward and, and resolving many of the challenges that we have today. So thank you. And please can we give big, warm welcome to Queen Zinkler over here, as well as our two speakers, Ernest and Mike, onto the stage. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Fred, for that intro. First of all, it's so nice to see everyone this evening. Good evening to you all. How are you feeling? How are you doing? You guys sound a bit grumpy. I understand the traffic lights on the way here were a bit of a nightmare, but it's okay. We're going to lighten the mood. Hopefully, you've had a, uh, a glass of wine or two and you're ready for this evening. Before we kickstart, just to kind of put us into the theme and the mood for this evening, we're just going to play two quick videos um, which are just going to set the tone for tonight and our discussion on 
building a brand and what does it actually mean? So we've got two of our heaviest chefs. Um, when it comes to this topic, I think by the end of this evening, we'll all be brand specialists. Um, if I can have the first video, please play out for us. No one should get naked. We're going to play our second video. Don't take anything off. The South African men's hockey team will not be going to the Olympic Games in Rio next year, despite having been crowned African champion. Saskok remain adamant that they are not going to change the qualification criteria for the Olympic Games. The message from the Saskok president, CEO and board is clear. Africa will not have a representative at the hockey events in Rio, an Olympic dream for many hockey players who have worked tirelessly and funded their own way to tournaments has officially come to a gut-wrenching end. The South African men's hockey team are going all out to make the Tokyo 2021 Olympic dream a reality. The team has now enlisted the help of the digital platform matchkit.co to help raise the money required to fund the Olympic campaign. For a national team to have crowdfunding campaign going, it's sort of unheard of. We're not 100% sure yet about what our final Olympic costs are going to be. And at the moment, if we're not careful, that comes out of the players' pockets. There's no doubt uh, it's a bit of a Hail Mary. The crowdfund has been really good. I mean, we've managed to raise about 300,000 from that so far. One of the big drives that's been supporting you, helping you out, has been the Match Kids initiative. And how much has that initiative helped you? It's helped us immensely, and just to start the conversation, not just about the money. Getting people to ask questions, maybe ruffling a few feathers on social media, that's been really, really good for us. And we're really grateful to Match Kit for what they've done. so many moments that give you so much hope for a bright future for our South African hockey men. We've never had teams that have really lit up the stage and also had some of the best teams in the world look at them in awe, not just for the way that they played, but for the way they carried themselves on and off the field and brought a different element of enjoyment. Okay, so... I hope you have some thoughts after watching that. Ernest, if I may, I'm going to start with you because the first video we saw was in relation to naked insurance. Um, now, for people that are unfamiliar with naked insurance, what is naked insurance all about? And if you can tell us, what were the values that underpinned um, naked insurance that then informed how you brand yourselves as an, an insurance company and how that informs your strategy in terms of marketing? Thanks, uh, Z. It's really nice to be here. And thanks for you and for Fred for hosting us. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming out. It's quite an intimidating, before I answer the question, it's a, an intimidating reality to be in a room with so many people that know more about a topic than I do, <laughs> uh, yet I get to be the person that's, that's sitting on stage uh, telling the story. Um, so bear with me. I, I have a, a, a long and interesting history of working in insurance, and then I ended up starting a business, and now I'm telling the story of how we built that business. Um, that doesn't mean I know all that much about building a brand, but uh, we've had some fun, and so it's, uh, it's a privilege to be telling the story. I think the first thing to say about building a brand that's important for me is I've never been a big fan of a practice that a lot of people in this room would have gone through of picking like a handful of words to describe and summarize their brand. For me personally, I always find words like aspirational or modern or classic or stuff like that. I, found, I find those words very generic and then 
typically, if you try and use those words to describe your brand, you're not really describing your brand in a unique way. And I also feel that many of those words uh, have different people feeling different about that. So, like, classic means something else to me than it does for you. So I've always taken the easy way out when people ask me about the Naked brand and put me on the spot. I always just say, you will know it when you see it. Or actually, you'll know it when you experience it. And so on the one hand, I, I don't like those words. But the reason I'm saying that is because I'm contradicting myself in that those words are important. And when I look back on the Naked journey, the, the word that has been fundamental to our values, fundamental to why we started this thing, fundamental to what we do, how we do things, and what people get, is actually the word naked. Like, that word is so core to our values, and it's so descriptive of what we're trying to achieve, that I feel it's been easy in our communication journey to actually land that. That, on the one hand, we're about the tech, we're about this technology that enables you to do insurance online without the frustrations and without the phone calls and all the other frustrating things. And on the other hand, we're about this, uh, this journey of making insurance transparent and removing the conflict of interest and removing the hidden agendas and all the mind games that the old insurance used to do. So it's about being slick and modern and clean, but about being human and real and transparent. And I am trying to, with more talented people than myself that actually work on this brand, we're trying to tell a story that is not making anything up, but purely just reflective of the actual values and the actual story of what we're doing uh, in, the, in the business. Sure. Some of the key points that I'm hearing from Ernest is um, the importance of transparency and really um, you know, being true to the human experience. Having just watched Match Kit, I think my preconceived notion of branding and marketing has been that you know businesses are out there just to increase sales or um, manipulate consumer behavior so that you can get the sale increase but what match kit just showed us is that sometimes businesses have the ability to leverage the influence that they've built in society for greater good can you just take us through um, the whole experience with assisting the south african hockey team to make it to the olympics and why match kit chose um, to go about it that way Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. It's like being at the theater again. You are alive and we can see your expressions. So give yourselves a round of applause. There we go. We've got to keep that energy up. Yeah. DJs didn't play in the house. <laughs> so I think when you guys sent out the email the other day, you were talking about if you asked 100 people what brand is, what branding is, you get 100 different answers. And that's the reality, right? So my perspective of that is that branding is a, a dose of functional benefits, but it's also very heavily steeped in emotion. And for me, the match kit example, and the reason why I ask you to play that, was because I'm an obsessed sports fan. I'm a suffering cricket fan, as of recent times, all the way back to when I was in primary school. And I have a lot of PTSD around that. But the reality is, when it comes to things that you are investing in, that you are supporting, think about Formula One. And so many of us in this room, none of us ever could have sat up till 10 o'clock at night watching a ridiculous race in South America before Drive to Survive. Drive to Survive brought us into a space that we'd never been invited to before. Normally, there's just a bunch of rich kids racing around a track, arguing into their microphone. Ah, oh, he cut me off. Ah, oh, he drove into me. Ah. Oh. That German guy is very aggressive. Oh, that British guy, he says ugly things about my mom. You know, like, that's generally how Formula One was. Still very much the same kind of thing. But now, it's got the drama, and it's got the highs and lows. It's, people call it the telenovela for men yeah. and women. People <laughs> equally equal amounts of love for it across the, the spectrum. And for me, I believe that when you are a startup, when you are a small business, when you are a product or service, when you are a new R&D lab, of a business. People buy into the people first before they buy into a brand. I mean, Naked is very different because here you are a humble uh, CA actuary behind the scenes. But for the majority of times, you have people buying into people. So when you think about the Googles of the world, the Twitters, we think of those pioneering crazy characters, the Jacks, 
the Schmitz, all those kinds of characters behind the scenes. And with the hockey team, they had both a poor brand and they had a poor knowledge of the individuals. People who played hockey know who those characters are. But the average South African doesn't. You could walk into the captain of the hockey team in a, in a shopping center and you wouldn't know who he is. And our approach was very much like, there's this team, they're really good, they represent a whole host of different backgrounds, shapes, and sizes. Hockey is an incredible game. I'm not a hockey fan by any stretch of the imagination. But it has so many recipes that are similar to rugby, the type of people, where they're from, their backgrounds, how you have extreme poverty, extreme affluence, and how this melting pot of individuals has come together to create a team that we can all get behind and get very excited about. But nobody knows them. So we use the drive to survive strategy. Build the brands of those individual players, allow them to plug into their networks and their communities, allow them to be the faces of a crowd fund and ultimately put their team onto the global stage. And for us, it was, a, it was an obsessive idea that was born out of lockdown. Who's gonna be affected by lockdown? Everybody. But otherwise, artists, people in music, entertainers, athletes. An average athlete is bankrupt within five years of playing professionally. So here's a platform to help them think about themselves as a personal brand to commercialize their off-field opportunities. So that's a roundabout story that I'm going to cut off right now. But <laughs> yes. that's why we got involved, got excited. And Ex what better way than a small little startup on the southern tip of Africa that we can stick it to the man, and the man being Natim Tetwa, because he hates athletes. Anyway. <laughs> 100%. No, I'm Loves glad money. that you Match Kids stepped up in that respect. I mean, you we're often appalled about how um, our Olympians aren't supported until they get to a certain point. Um, and to kind of throw the ball back in your court, what are insurance companies doing? I mean, like, I think a lot, uh, the question that I started off with right now was, um, what's been your worst insurance experience, right? Most of us are angry with our insurance companies. When it's time to claim, it feels like all they care about is what their risk models are telling them. Um, the consumers often put at the back end. It's as if profits are put over the human experience. So, Ernest, not to uh, corner you too much, but... Um, you had to now build an insurance company and kind of deal with that backlog from consumers who have these preconceived notions of how bad and ill um, insurance companies are. How did you buy that brand equity and try and um, kind of change that perception and that narrative? I mean, you had to bite your tongue there to not start saying very horrible things about an industry. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll do the same. I, I often find it easier to talk about running a tech business than, than, than running an, an insurance business because people uh, get less defensive. But the reality of even our tech business is we sell an insurance product and so the thing must actually work. And it, it blew my mind when I saw a stat this morning in a new study that literally said 40% of South Africans that have insurance feel comfortable lying to their insurance company. 40%. And the reason they do is they feel that for many years the insurance companies have abused them. And so if you want to like, just get your dues, you have to lie to, um, to get it back. And that's really unfortunate. And so our mission was to say we're turning this whole thing on its head. Uh, I won't go into too much of the details, but, but fundamentally, I've, I've, I mean, I've worked in insurance for way too long. And everybody that, has, that I've met those people were not bad people. They were not trying to do bad things. It was just inherent in the business model that profit depends on whether you paid a claim or not. Profit depends on not delivering on the promise. And so when we, when we shifted that around and we built this business model where we said, we're a tech business, we're gonna take a fixed percentage of premiums. And in years when there's money left, when claims are lower or a hailstorm didn't happen, in those years, we're gonna give all that money away to charities. We're gonna get our, our customers to, to pick good causes that they want to, us to support on their behalf. And we're gonna pay that money to those good causes. The primary thing we're trying to achieve is not to have that money flow to those causes. That's a secondary benefit. The primary thing is it changes our incentives. And it's been so liberating to run a business where our incentives are aligned with our customers. And I think, a lesson for me uh, there is, if you think about other industries, you've got people in this room that do it, are doing more interesting jobs than me in, in more interesting industries. The process of building a business and ultimately telling people about it in, an, in a way that, that you genuinely believe and you get excited about hinges on aligning interests. 
the moment you are doing something that you are super passionate about and you believe this thing is actually going to deliver, I get my friends at Bryce and all my family members to buy naked insurance because I genuinely believe in it. Like that just changes the game in terms of how you get excited about something. And so I think we, we're not perfect yet. We've got a long way to go. But what I love about the naked difference and the impact it has on the communities, but more importantly, is the fact that when you see somebody on Twitter these days ask, oh, who would you recommend for insurance? You would see five answers saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then you would start the people coming and they start saying, have you tried out naked? And like that for me is the most rewarding thing. Ladies and gentlemen, you aren't at a heavy chef tonight, <laughs> and the networking event is not cheese and wine. It is a sell to Naked Insurance, and you'll all be getting a free, not a free, a paid-for sign-up subscription to Naked Insurance tonight. Thank you very much. A free subscription on, on the house. <laughs> um, but Mike, um, just to kind of add on to what Ernest said, I think he alluded, you alluded to the fact that basically you, you were the one in the forefront basically doing the marketing and the promoting of Naked Insurance at the beginning. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are often not sure whether branding is something they should outsource or they should do themselves. Um, Sometimes people feel that as an entrepreneur, you're the most passionate, you're the one that understands the brand, and you're almost able to know what's in line um, with what your brand is promoting. Would you say outsource or do it yourself, insource? I D mean, DIY. In -house. Um, no, I think, you know, like I've always been a fan of bootstrapping, and for me, you know, you don't have this absolute like surplus of cash like it's very important how you're living one month to the next and it's a critical component and i think for so many people in this room like you say you are the most obsessed you are the greatest evangelist for your business here the accountant actuary is at your bras just like doing your tap dance and and showing off your product and the thing is like you can get to a stage when you grow and then you have budgets and you're able to spend that but initially money is too emotionally connected to you as the person and money is not seen as a budget. When you're a multinational, when you're a corporate, budgets are line items. But when you're a startup and a small business, it's potentially whether you can pay your rent at the end of the month or not. And you are the one that's going to be the greatest evangelist. And if you can't unashamedly go out there and tonight shake hands with somebody and say, this is my business and this is why I'm obsessed with it, then you know there's a very good chance that this might not be the space for you. It is a constant, unashamed sell. And on that point, because you've worked with big brands and um, small brands, what are some of, I think in your, actually in one of your recipes, um, so if you haven't checked out um, our Heavy Chef's recipes on branding, I would encourage you to do so. You spoke about big brands being able to develop their own personality. What, do, what does that mean and what does it entail? And if I think of big brands that have been successful in creating their brand, such as Nando's, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from them. And Ernest, feel free to jump in in terms of what you learned, any mistakes that you um, had to go through in developing your brand as well. So for me, I always like the exercise of if you were a celebrity, if your brand was a celebrity, how would it sound? Because what that does is it allows your team, whether it's a couple of founders or board members and a whole marketing team, it forces everyone to have an opinion and to put it on the table. My brand is Anele. My brand is Trevor Noah. My brand is XYZ. So by ha having the team articulate that, you get to a much quicker point of like what that personality of that brand is and what you want it to be. And then that informs how you speak on social, how you communicate in your newsletters, in your marketing material, on your app. And if you don't have a, like a clear understanding, there's no ways that you can brief your marketing team at large. There's no ways you can understand what that thing stands for. So value props and you know, single-minded concepts and all these fancy terms, like they're very valuable. But ultimately, if you aren't all tweeting in the same direction or reeling or TikToking or spinning on your head on Be Real, then you know, you, you're all moving in different directions and the brand comes across as schizophrenic in the market. I wasn't planning on saying this, but let's go back um, <laughs> to, uh, m to for me ch to challenge you a little bit. Yeah, um, love this. And I mean, you like you run a business that is famous for making other businesses famous. Like you make them go viral, and obviously, you've done an amazing job with with many examples recently. Um, I want to ask you the question about for which businesses is it right to work with an advertising agency? And for which businesses is it right to do it in-house? 
I, I have a view, um, and I, I want to comment on it, but I want to hear your, your answer first. Jeez, that is like the reason why we exist. I mean, <laughs> that is the biggest question. But I think the reality is, is based on your size, determines whether you should outsource or insource. So I believe if you're a small business, you shouldn't be outsourcing. I think you should be taking it on, whether you are Fred the barman or Fred the CEO of Heavy Chef, like you are the one that has to be in the trenches, have to be developing that. As you become bigger, I think it's important for you to outsource that process, but with a very collaborative insourced approach. Like you guys were speaking to me about this offline. You've got a team of writers in-house that are doing an incredible job, but they come with this very vast, extensive background of agency work where they've worked across multiple industries, financial services, FMCG, etc. But ultimately, my view is that as you become bigger, you have to outsource, you have to have an agency because they bring you the opportunity to challenge where your headspace is at, but your in-house team has to have the freedom to be able to challenge back. It's a very collaborative environment, and the more we've gone through COVID, the more we've come out of the other side, I believe that that collaboration now is more important than ever. Like, we're seeing it with 6060, we're seeing it with, like, the work that I'm doing with Discovery recently, like, the fact that you've got collaborations between in-house and, and external, these things make the communication better, because you become myopic if you rely on one side or the other. Yeah. I hear you. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, there's, 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 Boom. there's some, there's some good in what you're saying and I, and I understand most of it. I don't agree with all of it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's worth saying that my personal view is that, that size is not necessarily the indicator. It, it, That's it, what she it, said. It's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. it is, it is very dependent on, on the phase of the business, the, the sort of the, the stage that it's in. It's very dependent on, on the actual product, the nature of what, of, of what you're doing. And in our case, like we've had some really good experience working with people externally, but we prefer to do the bulk of it in-house because we found that in our case, the specific brand identity and having consistency in rolling it out, the, the, the bulk of the, the creative process happening in-house is serving us really well. And so I'm, I'm not saying that doesn't mean we never get external input. From time to time, we definitely need fresh eyes and fresh, fresh sets of input and definitely fresh skills. But in our case, th because, because the, the, the and, and, uh, and to a large extent, the insurance industry has had this challenge of people promising stuff and promising stuff and promising stuff, and it doesn't really translate. And in our case, it is, it's almost so personal that we want to make sure that what we promise is real, that we don't want an ad agency coming up with a line not actually understanding what we, what they're promising. Like, I want the guy coming up with a line to understand how the app works. And so there's no one right answer here, and I'm not saying we may be taking it to an extreme, but, but we, we're seeing value in that. No, of course, and I think the way that you've straddled that is correct, and I think we, what's interesting and the experience that I've had with other advertising agencies is the average advertising agency will love to evangelize the top of the funnel, bring the customers in, get to the conversion, but they don't actually know how to convert for financial services product. The average advertising agency doesn't understand money and it doesn't understand sport. Okay, on that note, before they, um, we'll be having a good rivalry here, but I want to open up the question to the audience. Mo's got the mic. If you just lift your hand um, and Mo will come to you. Um, and yeah, I think we've got quite a few. You welcome to either direct um, your question to a specific person, or it can just be a general question. He says Tiffany is always first, which is true. Hi, hi Tiffany. Um, my question is for Ernest. When Naked first started advertising on billboards, it felt a little bit to me like because of the name of your brand, your team was going for this sort of low-hanging sexual innuendo fruit. And I found that excruciatingly irritating as a copywriter. Sorry. But, <laughs> but then there was like this evolution in your billboard, certainly, where that stopped happening and it suddenly became very clever. And it became about call centers and paperwork. And it was, it was like the, the really functional benefits, not the low-hanging fruit. So I assumed that you had gone from in-house writers to an agency. Am I wrong? Did it go the other way? <laughs> She's a, she's a hidden shopper. I planted her. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, Ernest? 
No, so all the, all the, everything you've seen in the last year or two has been in-house. Every single thing. Um, the, the good things you, s the very first things you saw that were bad was me. <laughs> um, <laughs> then phase two was an agency that did good work. So that was better than my stuff. Um, but now what you see, what everything you've seen over the last year or two has been in-house. But, but I mean, it's, at, I, so just, it sort of supports my point on the agency versus in-house. But I think you made another important point, which, is, which I just want to touch on, which is important. I mean, obviously, with our name, um, like it's important to build a, a, a sustainable brand here. We don't want to be tacky. We don't want to push this thing too far. And, and you won't see us pushing it further than, than we have. Because we, like, ultimately, this name naked must just be a, a word that you associate with quick, clean, it works, and transparent, and, 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 and it delivers. Uh, I, d I don't want to, we're not going to push it further than we have. <laughs> so th yeah. I just want to say something nice while we, like, we're having this like, good debate here, is that you guys really got to the core, exactly how you positioned yourselves at the start of the conversation, you got to the core of what's the stuff that irks people from competitors. And when you unlock that premise and those key insights, you then flipped what every copywriter is taught. Don't sell on negatives, sell on positives, you know? But by going down the never route, you told people flat out, this is what you never do when you're a naked customer. And, and I mean, again, when, this is not about talking just about naked, but I quickly want to say, <laughs> so, 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 so this is about recipes. We're at Heavy Chef. What is a recipe for, for, for building a brand successfully? Is in that case, Having the team that came up with, it, with those things and breaking those rules, having them have the freedom to tell me, who initially didn't like those at all, because I said, no, exactly, ads should say what you should be doing. They shouldn't tell you not to do this. And that was my reaction. And then they said, no, 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 you're wrong. We're doing these ads. And now those billboards went up and everybody loves it. So I think that's an important lesson uh, is not to let people – like me, make decisions, but just give other people freedom. <laughs> but also, uh, I want to add to that one final thing. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's important. We were talking about this beforehand when you guys were all walking in. And what I absolutely think about ideas is that there are so many of them happening at the same time with so many creative teams simultaneously. If you delay and you are a laggard in putting the trigger on that execution, you will definitely lose out to the competition. Because how amazing that two tech businesses that use AI to sell insurance both went out of billboard campaigns at the same time that nobody knew about. Pineapple and Naked at the same time. And those are the things that people are talking about. They're talking about Naked and Pineapple billboards on social media. It's so meta, but not Facebook meta, like beta meta. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so, thank you, Tiffany. We're going to go to the second question. Thanks. Hi, guys. Uh, Thomas here from Frank. I suppose in initially I thought uh, to Ernest, but I think both of you um, can comment on this. It's got to do with tone. So it's, I suppose a follow-on from the previous question, I feel like Naked has sort of converged on the sort of a tongue-in-cheek kind of humorous uh, tone. How core do you think tone is to brand identity? And has it, a, for you, evolved over, over time? Um, and just some of the thoughts maybe that went on in the background around that. Yeah, just a quick one on that, and I think then Mike can also answer. Um, the two things on tone, the one is, it is quite personal. And in our case, most of the copy on the app and on the website and when you're chatting to Rose, uh, we've got some people in our business that just are, are, are good representation of, of how we're trying to speak. And so we always try and go back to those people and make sure that they're comfortable with the, with the tone that we're using. That said, one of the important lessons we've learned is that you, although you have to be consistent, you can't speak in the, exactly the same way every time you speak on every single platform to every person. Especially in our business, we've learned that the bulk of communication we do is digital. And so we know who, who's seeing our ads. We know that we're targeting this ad at this group of people living in that city with this age, and this ad at that group. And, and there's an element of consistency, obviously. It's the same brand speaking. But we are definitely tweaking our messages and our tone to be relevant to what we're doing. And I don't think we've, we've nailed all of it. Like, we, we keep tweaking and refining, 
but the overarching thing I want to th sort of respond to your question is that first point of we, we have a group of people internally that, uh, that, that we really trust. And we sort of use that, people, those, that, that group as a sounding board, as a panel. For everything, everything we say, we always go to them and tell them, are you comfortable with that this is the way Naked speaks? Yeah, and just um, uh, like from a consumer point of view, um, I absolutely love the account from Innocent Smoothies. It's a UK smoothie brand. It's one of my favorites. I use it so many times as a reference point for FMCG brands because they just are so unashamed with their presenting of their brand. And some days they'll be like, hey, it's 20 degrees outside, so it's time for a, an innocent smoothie. Like, they, they slot their brand in ways where they're overly doing it and they're overly forced, but it feels friendly and it feels fun. And when we were working on the Rocker Mama's brand from 2016 to 2020, um, we had a team of community managers, and they had, like, a structure of certain words and phrases that we would use to give the personality and feel like that the right kind of social space that you should be playing in. But then they also had freedom with someone complained about the brand unnecessarily. They had freedom to drag the customer because we, we purposely set up the fact that we're going to clap back. And like, if that's how the youth speak, then you must speak like the youths. So we had youths running the social media accounts, not the old white dude in the agency. And um, <laughs> it's true, I'm the old white guy in the agency now. That is what the reality that I'm in. But, um, you know, I think that ultimately you have to have this freedom, whether it's an in-source team or outsource team, whatever it is. Like, what does the structure look like and where do you push it? And then off the back of that, you will make mistakes. But ultimately, if you're all pulling in the similar direction, the best thing that I loved about working on that Rocker Mama's account is we had about three or four different community managers and they all had like a grasp of a, of a different language. There was a, a Zulu dominant individual, Kosa dominant, et cetera, et cetera. And then they would respond back in the language that the person had dissed the brand in to like actually like have a go right back at them. So if there was a mistake from the brand, apologetic, let's sort it out. Even if it was Uber Eats, fix the produ product, you'll get it within the next hour or you'll get a voucher for your return. So it was always apologetic about flaws in the product and in the, in the business. But when it came back to people just wanting to drag you because they wanted to get internet fame, ah, you must clap back. <laughs> uh, we had another question in the audience. So, yeah, oh, Louis. <laughs> so just a quick practical question. If I'm a startup, there's a proliferation of channels. Do I just choose to focus my branding on one channel and own that channel, or do I try and spread my brand across all the channels? So the That's channels cool. for a startup to use when yeah. you're starting out. So I'll start with my opinion on my own journey and my own starting an agency in 2010. Like, I loved Twitter at the time. Twitter was my most active space. It was the face that space that I felt comfortable with. I'm more writing dominant than I am visually dominant. So I built my personal brand by tweeting and then convincing guys like Fred to make me have a speaking slot at his conference, which was also your conference at the time, which was the IMC. These guys started the IMC, which is now owned by NetBank. Actually, that's where this whole thing started. So it's basically a full 360 moment. And by going out and tweeting and speaking at events and venues and just going up on stage and telling people my opinion on marketing and why it was broken and where the parts needed to be improved upon, like I took my digital voice and I transcended it into the physical space. So the space that you are the most active, if you are the most active TikToker in the world, then do the TikToks. So that'll grow your business. There are guys selling spreadsheet training on TikTok. Ernest, have you seen this? <laughs> It's mind-blowing. Are you on the TikTok? No, I'm not on the TikTok. No, you must be on the TikTok. <laughs> um, uh, Next, it's Be Real. That's what we're going to do. Be Real. We're going to get a notification. We're going to Be platform. Real in the crowd. We won't know when it's coming. You know Be Real. No, you won't know when it's coming. It's going to no. just... And then we're going to have to do a Be Real, or we're going to lose out in two minutes, and then we have to wait 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just add to, to, to his question one. Uh, it obviously, so we're not talking about sales, Lee, uh, EJ, and we're talking about branding. Um, the only bit I wanted to make, comment I want to make, is four or five years ago, I made the statement that we're a tech business. Naked will never, ever, ever do a billboard. Oh. Um, <laughs> and, and then, again, people corrected me and convinced me that, that this integrated communication approach is important. And in our case, it is a lot about credibility. Like, you, don't, you, want, the you want the business insuring your 20 million rand house to be around. And so a big part of what we're saying by having a big billboard over the M1 is just like you can take us seriously. And so it depends on how you, what, what you're selling. But in our case, it was important that we go into multiple channels. And the more we've consistently done that, 
the more it, it, it has had significant effects on our lead volumes, but especially on our conversions. Like they, there used to be a whole bunch of people checking us out and not buying from us. And in the last year or two, since our marketing has gone like this, people are buying from us uh, and the conversion is way higher. And I think a massive part of that is just credibility. And I just want to add to that. I worked on one of my first jobs. I worked on South Africa's first um, mobile bank. And it wasn't one of the big four. And it was all through USSD. And they had like these foot soldiers that would go into uh, rural areas and like spread the gospel around the product. And it had a Maestro branded content, uh, card linked to it. So you could do remittance payments. It was one of the slickest products. But the problem was there weren't billboards in the rural areas of this brand. So there was distrust for it because what if my money gets taken? I mean, I'm taking a, a chance, sending my money back to Mozambique, back to Zim uh, via taxi driver. The chance of my money getting taken there is actually less than this company that doesn't have a billboard. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a really good, especially with financial services. People expect to see your spend on traditional media because then it gives you this comfort that there's like this behemoth looking after your bags of money. Yeah. To both of you, really quickly, it'll be more on digital because I think it piggybacks on your points about traditional. Um, there's a bit of threat on integrity, authenticity on a lot of digital platforms. And I loved what you just said, <coughs> sorry, about your personal journey on Twitter, for example. So what do you see being a challenge, potentially building brands, connecting the way maybe Naked has with platforms that are disconnected or have an Elon Musk as a CEO, for example? That was a Naked question. <laughs> 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 Let me just buy you some time. Let me quickly just this you to be real. <laughs> Who wants no, to take I mean, what, what, what I want to say is, What's certainly uh, something that we invest a lot of time in, because the world is is getting challenging by the more challenging by the day, is this this concept of the the extent to which we can customize the creative for the specific people that we're showing it to, uh, and and by and large, I understand that the world is uh, very feels very strongly about privacy, and personally, I don't want some random business to know too much about me. But what we found is that a, a big portion of our advertising is performing way better than a traditional insurance ad where they sponsor the refs or they just do a TV ad. Why? Because our stuff is targeted. We know when people are buying cars. We know when people are going th through certain life stages. And we can use that to make sure that the right people are seeing our advertising. And, it's, and so our advertising is getting way better return on what we're spending. And, and so the biggest challenge for us is increasingly with operating systems introducing privacy restrictions, but as users get more and more sensitive, our ability to actually show the right ad to the right person at the right time, it, like that's a science. It's, it's the, that's like we've got some of the smartest people I know working on, on solving that problem. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, an investment worth making. So that's an, an area of challenge, but I also think an, an area of opportunity. Yeah, definitely you're going to struggle more. I think there's more lean towards de-anonymized de -anonymized data, which then is going to stop the tracking. So hopefully you're thinking forward on that. Mike, do you have anything to add to that question? I, I actually just need you to ask me the question again, because I was just so wrapped in the rabbit hole of personalized data. Just, Sorry. yeah. So platforms versus the future of branding, yes. um, and then using Twitter and challenges with brands, and people finding integrity with brands or authenticity with brands on platforms. So I think with all these things, you know, there's always the pick and choose a lane, right? And is something going to explode in your market? Because right now, I, I keep joking about be real, because I'm trying to be cool. But effectively, like that might not take off in our market. If you look at like Snapchat and its initial growth here, like the growth trends indicated we'd have a lot greater success until the Zuck factory came along and rolled out Reels and then TikTok and all of those elements. So what's always difficult is like, what do you pick the, as the lane to work within to build the brand? And for me, like I think this conversation today is kind of multi-hatted. It's like the personal brand of you as the leader or the startup, and then you as the startup brand, and like where you go and where you play with that. And for me, like I'm a huge network effect person. So where is the network that is the most value to your business playing? Like it could still be Facebook. I mean, it could still be a, a, something that's more traditional as a platform, or it might be a good opportunity to play in TikTok. And what I like about the new platforms, and what I like about the more um, the less Zuckerberg owned ones, like 
is that you have a space to be able to go viral a lot quicker because the algorithms are less constricted. New platforms need to have less constricted algorithms because they need the content to get out. They need every single individual to feel like they can go viral and become a, an internet celebrity because that's what we're all hunting. We're all hunting our 15 minutes of digital fame. And ultimately, that's where TikTok is winning right now. TikTok is giving you opportunities to go viral and we're seeing brand uh, adoption, execution, conversion happening in that space because more and more eyeballs are being exposed to the content. For me, I still love LinkedIn because I think that LinkedIn also, when you look at the organic reach and the engagement, especially as a personal brand, and you know we chat about it with some of our friends in the audience, is like they're very smart about how they use their execs at a LinkedIn level versus how the brand shows up in a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram level. And that's why it's this constant almost like gaming system to understand where you need to play to convert to get the best upside from the customers that you need and what does scalability look like to you. In my agency, scalability for us is tiny. Like we can operate at 30, 40 clients at any one stage. But if you're in a space where you need to attract tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions, you know, what is the best space that's giving you the best conversion based on your insights and your spend? So that was a long-winded answer where I just said a lot of buzzwords. I'll Thanks, have a, sh I'll have a shot at the bar for the buzzword bingo. I'm going to uh, – who's got the mic? Oh, okay. okay cool. Oh. Um, question mostly for Ernest. Um, and it ties into a couple of points to be made by yourself as per questions from the audience. I'd like to get your views around the connection and the tie-in between culture, uh, corporate culture, startup culture, et cetera, and the brand. Uh, you know, brand is a promise, and for any of us in the room as interacted with a corporate, as soon as you interact with it and it breaks that, or at the bri, as you said, with an employee, and it's fundamentally different. For the startups in the room, how do you think about growing your brand related to the culture of the organization? Yeah, that's super important. I mean, uh, we, we're fortunate that we're still a fairly small team in that we're, we're predominantly focused on building technology. And so we, we, we're a small team relative to the number of customers that we actually serve uh, and it's and it's and it gives us the ability to really maintain that culture that is that important and for us the culture is number one going back to I, I don't try and want to try and copy that other oak with these circles but it goes back to why did we start this business um, and and we keep we remind ourselves about that every day uh, and and so not a single person working at naked doesn't understand that and doesn't buy into that and so I think that culture of genuinely the mission that we're on, but then number two, like we said with the billboards, have people that are better equipped at making that decision than me make those decisions. And so like we find massive value from a culture perspective in learning from, from Netflix, their freedom and responsibility model of, of managing or, and, and, and building a culture where people are empowered. Uh, where people take ownership, but people are empowered to genuinely take ownership. And the, the, the number of experiments we do in our business, lots of them fail, but people are encouraged to do experiments and fail. And, and I think that that's served us really well. And, and obviously it's a challenge for us as we get to the stage where we're now, we've, we're becoming a big business. Um, like I genuinely feel very, and I'm, and I'm fortunate that the other leaders in the business feel the same way, that we don't want to give up on that culture. We started this business not to become a corporate, but to genuinely have a big impact. Uh, and so I I'm, I'm hope we get it right. I just wanted to add to that as well. I think like whether it's our own agency or the, some of the brands we work with, some of the best examples of scalable culture I've seen is when people genuinely feel like they can put up their hand and they can make a comment. So like the way that Checker 6060 is structured, it's almost like a startup that is in its own building. It's still part of the mothership, but ultimately the people within that space, they all feel empowered to be able to have a comment. So there was a young lady at the start of the year. She saw that Tinder Swindler was trending. So she put it into the group, whether they use Slack or WhatsApp, or whatever it is. She said, hey guys, this is tr uh, trending across Twitter. People in South Africa are talking about it. Can we make a Tinder? Or can, we, can we make a don't get swindled mission? And that's where the idea first started from. Like they put that onto a mission on their app because a young lady called Nasipe Wase came up with this idea because it was trending. And then I said to the guys, "Listen, let me." I screen grabbed it, 
posted on LinkedIn and Twitter. I got 100,000 impressions in like four or five hours. And I said, guys, it's like, look how massive it is. Let's make a video. Convinced him to sign up for budget. We made a video that night. It was a Thursday. It was on TikTok in the morning. And it had 5 million views by the Sunday. So like, ultimately, if you empower your team to be able to put up their hands, that's why I make the jokes about being the old white guy in the office, in my office. Because on the WhatsApp group, I can say, have this idea, guys. And then people go like, nah, old white guy. Or like... <laughs> Mainstream South Africa. Like, those are kind of the extremes. And by doing that, like, we put out the opportunities. That, like, we're in a situation here in our country where we are fraught with opportunities that could go very south in a very lot of possibilities if you don't have the, 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 the peace of mind or the humility to ask. We've seen it with Theresa May. We've seen it with people in all different settings. And sometimes it's like, I'm a guy and I don't know about women's hair. So don't ask me to be the guy signing off. I'm the guy that doesn't know about billboards. Don't ask me about signing off billboards. And the thing is, we're so scared of offending people, but it's so much better if your internal team says, yo, this is a racist-looking campaign. You should not go out. Yeah. Like, people are going to get bleak. That You're going to get dragged because you are having a diss of someone's hair in this setting. This is terrible decision-making. But most of these corporate people are too scared to raise their hand because they're going to get their heads chopped off. Yeah. Mike, sorry, just to bring it back on that point, when you as a brand have messed up, you've uh, had the Tresemme experience or H&M with the uh, monkey ad. Or if you've been Matthew Booth. <laughs> or that too. How do you pull back the reins and like um, redeem your brand um, when circumstances like that happen? What, like what do we do? Jeez, I'm a, I'm a fan of stick your head in the sand and just let the storm blow over. Because nothing you say is going to, like, everything gets worse. Like, you're going to get dragged again. Also, you're going to put out a statement. Then people are going to then rush to the statement. And they're going to not have seen the thing with the cheesecake. Now I'm, like, levels deep in Sonia's Instagram. And I'm, like, eating the popcorn and the cheesecake simultaneously. Like, for me, there's always going to be another brand or another celebrity that screws up the next day. Stick your head in the sand. Boom, it's going to be terrible. Don't check your mentions. <laughs> Turn those things off. Go away somewhere. Switch the digital. Walk away. And just whoo, close your eyes because it's going to be a rough few days. Yeah. But that, uh, that's honestly feel. I think you just, you just got to own it. You just got to wear it and you just walk away from it. I mean, the other thing that I'm just sitting here thinking, uh, touch wood, is that, is that, I mean, obviously people complain about insurance. Every now and then people are unhappy about insurance, whatever. But we've been really fortunate that nothing dramatic has blown up. I'm sure it's coming. Um, Listen, can I tell you what's going to happen? I'm going to prophesize it for you. Okay. It's, it's, based, it's based on an old mutual tale. This lady, she didn't get paid out, so she came into the office. She brought like her dead relative to the building. In a bag. Because, because yeah. it, someone is going to find your offices. They're going to come and they're going to film themselves on Be Real Naked. And then... It's going to be like naked inception. And then you guys are going to blow up for a few days. Okay. But remember these moments. Okay. And you just, you've got to just ride okay. that storm. Let the okay. nudity go viral. Let, it's just it's generic enough. You'll be fine. You'll survive right. it. So I'll just ride it out. So you all ride it, it out. Yeah. 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 But okay. It, with that being said, I'm going to just check in our audience if we have anyone with a burning question. Okay. I think I'm going to take the last three. Then we're going to close up. So I've, I've knowledge one, two and three, sorry, okay, four, then we're done. Okay, so uh, Mo's just gonna pass the mic. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, what are the key components or what should I focus on when building my brand identity? What's your business? Uh, I run an online store. What do you sell? I sell accessories, um, fabrics, and that type of stuff. For me, I'm a huge fan of hyper niche. Mm. Always start hyper niche, tap into, I mean, you might sell belly rings on a Tuesday. <laughs> like, that could be your thing. If it's not, I'm taking commission in that idea. <laughs> but, but by being able to hyper niche, you know exactly who your customer is. You know exactly, like, you can spend your 100 bucks a day on Instagram or Facebook targeting them. You can go to markets. You can leverage those opportunities. But ultimately, like, hyper focus and hyper niche on the thing that you are so exceptionally good at and build your range off the back of that. And then consider what you do both online and offline. There's so many opportunities to showcase your wares in the physical space, whether it be markets or spaces. And there's going to be a lot of trial and error. And we don't experiment enough as entrepreneurs. If you go on any accelerator course, if 
you go on any bootstrapping kind of like headspace, they're always going to tell you experiment, 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 and ask, interview your customers. Mm -hmm. We don't do it enough. We don't ask the questions. You've got so much data from like five or six sales. You've got the email addresses. You've got the delivery. Say to them, why did you come to me of all the places? Why did you buy this belly ring on a Tuesday? And then off the back of that, you will start being able to map some insights in commonality of what people are looking for and why you appeal to them. Maybe it's something in your logo. Maybe it's the pictures that you shot selfies of you in the jewelry. And that's, I had an artist friend of mine. He sells beautiful abstract paintings. I gave him one piece of advice. I said, Neil, put yourself in the pictures. He was like, what? I said, get your wife to shoot you doing your print or your canvas or whatever. He's, his absolute engagement rates went through the roof because now there's a human connected to the art. Now there's an artistic story. Ah, oh, I get goosebumps. Ah, oh, people buy people. They don't buy products. Just while we wait for the question. And when you're doing the, t the testing and experimentation, don't let your mom uh, give her opinion as to whether she likes it or not. Get independent people to, and be willing to change when they tell you that you, they don't like it because their opinion matters more than your mom's. And, and I think that's such a good point because also, as startup founders, we are so like obsessed with our own view of how things are. So he could be like, hey, I have a niece. She's a 24-year-old white chick from Joburg. She drives a polo. Like, this is my customer. And then he builds a hypothesis around why he needs to talk to her and how he needs to approach her. But in actual fact, if he does it independently, he realizes he's brought his own conscious or subconscious biases to the table. If you can eradicate that kind of thinking, give yourself real, genuine interview data where people feel safe to give you the honest truth, that's when you can start figuring out what you need to do from those early stages of your business. Okay, question, please. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, when is rebranding healthy? Or when is it okay for you to add extra steps to your recipe? The reason why I ask this is, one time we did a campaign for KFC, and they basically wanted to find out how their uh, consumers found the masala crunch. And they had big budget, we used influencers, it was great. People hated it. Um, but for KFC, it was easy for them to take it out, and they continued being KFC. Now, for my best friend who's starting her restaurant, or can, if I can make an example of you, Ernest. Let's say Naked was received as raunchy. Um, how do you then continue to stick to your brand promise of the transparency and not shy away from what you wanted uh, away from the conventional insurance companies? But when, because the last point that I want to make is that when you're a startup, there's a lot of risks involved and understanding the, the how young Naked was, how did you know to say, we're still going to go through with this and we're still going to stick true to our values? So there are, there are type one and type two decisions in business. Type, type one decisions are when, you ma when you've made them, you can't turn around. Uh, type two decisions you need to review frequently like b and be willing to change them frequently. And so obviously put a bit more effort and research into the type one decisions. Uh, like us deciding that, uh, that our name is going to be naked was a type one decision. So once, once that was launched, that was launched. We're not going we're not, we're not to change our name. But... But, but be willing on the, on the type two things to, especially early on in the journey of the restaurant, be willing to tweak things and to, and to recognize that this was a type two decision. And, uh, and as the feedback comes in, if I need to make changes, make those changes earlier. The sooner you make them, the better. But because once you're a little bit down the road, you can't, there are a whole bunch of things that you can't change anymore. And so the, uh, our brand, as young as it is, a, a, a big portion of it is quite established now. And, and, and we won't go just changing things too easily. We won't, we won't play with it too much. Um, but I think like m having that understanding between what are the things that are fundamental to, like I'm convinced by this, the partners that I'm picking, the direction I'm going, the, the niche that I'm playing in, those are, those are for the most part type one decisions and so make sure that you get them right, but then be willing to tweak on the type two. I also have a restaurant uh, analogy for you. So Fred was talking about being Gordon Ramsay earlier, and Gordon would always say, your restaurant menu has too many effing items. <laughs> so that was the Gordon reference. <laughs> um, but here's a real world one. So Costa, give us a wave. Costa owns the Bedford View Rocker Mamas. Give him some love. And um, <laughs> so, so the, the founder of Rocker Mamas is a guy called Brian Altrich, and his first Rocker Mamas was in Randburg. So that Randburg Rockamama's first one that was ever launched. And it was in a center that did poorly. 
every shop that came in there, whether it was a bed shop or whatever shop, it always failed. And he went and he drove up and down that road because he kind of wanted to be in a space that was close enough to like a middle class audience, but also in a space that was busy enough for people to frequent and come for lunch or whatever. So that was kind of, he wanted to offer like this middle class offering that was slightly more premium. And the advice that he always said was, he's not going to take a new menu item and roll it out to 100, 150 rocker mamas every time he has a brainchild. What he's going to do, he's going to use the Randberg one as like a test kitchen. So that was where your early adopters came. That's where your biggest lovers of the brand were, and they were like the repeat customers. And what is always interesting about that was he had a lot more flexibility to be wrong with his decision. Like if they wanted to trial hot dogs, what does this audience think? And when he's tested it, got the recipe right, added the nachos, all the things that needed to be included, when he was happy and satisfied that he'd got enough good feedback or constructive criticism from that audience, it would then get rolled out to another additional 5, 10 stores, 20 stores, maybe the whole group. But he never went live with a new addition to the menu before it had been experimented. So whether you're selling food or insurance, you always have to experiment with some kind of use case and some kind of audience to prove your own subconscious or your own conscious biases are incorrect or correct. Because otherwise you're just wasting your time on an innovation that might fail. And the problem with the tech world, if you choose an option that doesn't scale or it isn't adopted, here you spend hours and hours of dev time and money and resources adding an innovation that doesn't add value to your customer base. I think we had another question. We had one last question. Sorry, is it up this way? This might be our last question, and then Fred's going to come up and tell us the winner of a person who's um, asked the most inquisitive question. It's PH from Market PC. I'm looking around in the room. I think we've got a lot of convincing to do with our brand because you all are not doing any caps. <laughs> so we'll talk after this. Um, so my question is... Um, how much a role does color play um, in a brand? Um, I'm looking at Naked, you guys are green. Um, the other guys are purple, <laughs> and you've got pink guys as well in my way. But um, I'm just thinking, um, I can identif identify you guys with your unique and different colors, but is there something more? Um, is there another benefit that, um, that are underlying that I may not be looking at um, from, from a customer point of view? So maybe just to know from you guys, what decisions um, lead you to choosing a specific, specific, specific color for your brand? Yeah, I won't give a long answer. Maybe you can add a bit more value. Um, the only interesting story I can tell on that is that, again, when we picked that color, it was during the same time where I had assumed we would be 100% a digital brand. And so we picked that color based on it being optimized for digital. So that's a it's, a it's a green that really pops nicely on different operating systems. And so when you've got a white screen and you've got this green button, like that specific green pops really nice on digital. Uh, turns out we're going to do billboards. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, you know, so the designers have had to back solve. Um, so we were, uh, and, and luckily it, it, it translated well, and they've done a good job in, in, in making billboards happen. But um, it, it, I, mean, I think maybe a lesson that I've learned is obviously pick the color and the broader CI and the broader brand identity that is going to be the best for the channel where you think you're going to be most prominent. But don't make the mistake that we made in that, like, bear in mind that the world may change, and you may end up having to use that asset in a different way, or you may think that you're only a mobile business and all of a sudden you're a desktop business as well. And so, so just have, have that foresight, which, which we didn't always have, uh, but we're fortunate that it turned out well in the end. There's a lot of science behind colors. Some people just pick them because they like them, but the reality is like you'll see like financial services generally skews towards blues because there's something about calming and the money. There's stuff around fast food and not having green. And every time I see fishaways, I worry that the food is off. Um, but it's true, though. Um, but I, I think you know, there's, a lot, there's a lot of research online about like reds and yellows. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can find about what you might be leaning towards or what you'll be planning on choosing. But I completely agree with that. It's like, where's the space that you're going to play the most dominantly? And how does that look? How does it pop? Like, how does your site all come together with that thing? How does the app, if it's an app, what does it look and feel like? And, and it's all around, like, 
some colors give something a more premium look than others. So like, what do you want to position yourself as? And you can go down an extreme rabbit hole trying to find a whole bunch of info around color. But um, yeah, I mean, I liked red, so that's why I made retroviral red. So that was literally my base, my base starting point. Yeah, and ladies and gentlemen, with that, I'm going to have to close and thank Ernest and Mike so much for joining us this evening. They'll still be around for a bit, so you're welcome to pick their brains over a glass of wine or some uh, CBD good leaf. But for now, we do have a winner to announce. I'm just going to hand over to Fred to do the honors. Thank you, Zinclair. Um, I'll ask you to hold the bag whilst I... I go through the very scientific uh, process that we went through. We had a group of Investec tax and fiduciary specialists outside here gathering with some naked insurance uh, um, actu actuarial scientists some, some <laughs> and the creative team from Retroviral. <laughs> they ended up doing funnels and hose pipes. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and with that, there was a bunch of people who asked questions. Uh, Tiffany, Thomas, Louis, Emmanuel, Dr. Craig Wing, and um, the online store lady. And uh, you need to always just remember to say your name. Um, that certainly helps. Uh, the, the pH color question, I think, was a good one as well. And so with the, um, the very scientific, algorithmic approach of uh, WhatsApp and <laughs> messages, we have a winner, which is Thomas from Frank, is it? There we go. And Thomas from Frank, who... They've raised a there lot of go, money sir. recently, so if you want yes. to come and target a guy that can uh, be your potential yep, new client, this is your man to network tonight, ladies and gentlemen. So, Do a so, quick Google search. And by the way, this is Frank, uh, the, the app, um, and I, I encourage you, it's Frank with a C. Uh, to go and check out, not Frank Insurance, Frank.net. Does anyone remember that? That was a If you back. die, we pay. Yeah. That's what their <laughs> tagline was. Guys, yeah. they, they, he's they not that like, guy. They yeah. were like naked yeah. before naked, but nonetheless, it's not that Frank. It's Frank of the Sea, and they're freaking awesome. So go check them out. Sebastian, is Sebastian here? There we go. Sebastian's here as well. We actually, by the way, have quite a few. Um, uh, we've got, I, I was checking in the audience. We've got quite a few heavy chefs. We've got Marco. Um, Candice, uh, the water sommelier, we have Tiffany, the copywriter lady, who uh, who sitting at the back there, also asked a great question. We've got Doug, we've got Craig, we've got Emmanuel, we've got John, we've got a bunch of people in the, cr in the crowd. So I want to encourage everybody to stick around. You are the community that's going to lift this country up out of where it is now <laughs> and, uh, and make a change. And there's been so many good things. I want to share a quick analogy. I think it was about 11 years ago when this very skinny, very cocky punk came up to me at Deloitte uh, in, um, in Morningside. We were doing an event. I used to run a digital agency, and Heavy Chef was kind of like a side project of what it was. This guy was like, I'm, I'm a stand-up comedian. I've come from the States, I think, and I want to start a... Uh, a digital agency, I want to start something. I was running, at, I was also the head of agencies at IB, and he was pestering me on the way to the car park. I was like, who is this dude? And it, it, it turned out to be Mike Sharman, just on the verge of starting Retroviral. And so I want to congratulate you from humble, inauspicious beginnings. You've rocked it. So well done. Um, and, uh, and Ernest... Just the work that you've done with Naked, and I think what I really appreciate, and anybody who hasn't seen it yet, please go into Heavy Chef and, uh, and check out Ernest's recipe on, uh, on brand building, as it happens. Uh, the actuary, talking about brand building, it is one of the most authentic uh, recipes that you'll see. Very uh, humble, straight up, honest, and super practical. And I just want to salute you, sir, for the work that you're doing, disrupting, shaking the tree, and, uh, and just bringing Naked to the fore, and, and, and being a great entrepreneur. So well done. Can we get a huge round of applause for... A shout out to DJ Sinclair in the house. DJ, DJ Sinclair. I was getting there. Our tax and fiduciary specialist, as well as, as, well as the chairperson of the Heavy Chef Foundation, heavychef.org, check it out. Great research work, great 
connection with the community and just you know bringing forward our aim to uh, to make entrepreneur education more equitable and accessible to to everybody so um Lastly, I just want to thank uh, particularly Payfast and Zero for all the support they've given us to make this event uh, uh, an, 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 a reality and as well as our other, our other sponsors who've just supported us for so long. Workshop 17, this great venue. And I want to thank you guys just for coming out, getting amongst it, interacting. I encourage you to stick around, start a conversation with somebody new, say howdy, say howdy to our speakers. Say howdy to me and the team and uh, and to each other and uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you.